Welcome back, t-tests today. These are parametric tests, i.e. tests based on assumptions about the data. If our data do not meet these assumptions, the tests are suspect. Most statisticians and nearly all psychologists will tell you that most tests we use are robust to violations of their assumptions. In other words, the tests tend to perform adequately, especially when we almost meet the assumed parameters. The two interpretations of this observation, that assumptions are foundational but not important, are first the cognitive miser one, check for assumptions but explain away minor violations as within tolerance, and second the conscientious one, find or make a test unique for your data set. In this lecture we will see how t-tests are an example of a move towards this second conscientious view an acknowledgement that the normal curve needed some customization to sample size. Note that both of the interpretations in my no doubt false dichotomy involve checking assumptions, so we will make sure that we have methods and standards for that in the R portion of this week's content. To orient ourselves or locate this topic in larger conceptual space, there are two types of statistical testing. First, significance testing usually signaled by the use of p-values as gatekeepers. If p meets cutoff, then I can interpret the data as though we are in the world where there is a difference, effect, or relation. And the other type of statistical testing, what tends to be called hypothesis testing or assessing the weight of evidence, which is what the probability content of the course is designed to elucidate or expand on. For the most part, t-tests are just simple significance tests. The p-value tells you how likely you are to get your data in the world where the null hypothesis is true, i.e. where there's no difference between groups or where all data could be expected to come from the same group. So the p-value is the proportion of times that sampling from the null world would yield the data you actually have. If working in a noisy environment did not impact performance on IQ tests, the observed difference between your noisy and quiet groups would occur this often. Notice the logic here. If null, then x percent likely to obtain data. We reject the idea that we would obtain something so unlikely to obtain, so we say not x percent likely to obtain data, therefore not null. This is a valid modus tollens denying the consequent form of reasoning, but since it involves probabilistic content, it does not necessarily follow. No matter how small your x percent, your p-value gets, there's still a likelihood that the data would be obtained in the absence of a difference or effect. So we are never fully or deductively justified in making our conclusion, that is in rejecting the null or in proceeding to act as though there is an effect or difference. Pragmatically, this is just the more technical and rigorous way of saying that your statistical conclusions are probabilistic and neither the math nor the logic behind them yields anything approaching certainty or soundness. But more substantively or pedantically, this is telling us what is structurally wrong with our methods. First, if we start with a silly, absurd, or wrong-headed null assumption, then our small p-value will be nearly guaranteed. And second, if the negation of the null does not directly imply the alternate hypothesis, then we have a bad test. Examples or explanations of the silly null assumptions would be a. the idea that any two groups would ever have the exact same values. Even the same people at different times would score a little bit differently. We have statistical standards and methods in part because of this obvious fact. But the null assumption still tends to be equality of groups. So returning to logic, we see that unlikeliness of an unlikely thing, equality, is evidence of something else? Well, no, not necessarily. Maybe, but not necessarily. Defeating a weak null does not make our hypothesis strong. The other example of a silly null assumption has the same moral. This is Meal's crud factor, which is the observation that things tend to move together non-randomly, but that whatever signal we assume underlies this might not be the reason why. 
When instructing positive psychology, I came across the crud factor quite often. Data noting that happier people do happier things or healthier things it is not or should not be surprising. But what are they using to support their claims of relation? Surprise at their findings. That is what the p-value is, a measure of how surprised we would be in the null world to get our data. If it's less than 1% likely, well, we would be very surprised in the null world. So we would surpri be surprised if we were in the null world. But of course we are not surprised by the fact that happy people have more positive daydreams, though your daydreams can be too positive, apparently. So when a study rejects the null that these things are unrelated, surprise, the question is, why should we believe their alternate hypothesis? The presence of surprise is not a reason to believe their alternate hypothesis. The crud factor is most obvious for me in positive psychology and social psychology. In social psychology, the crud tends to come from ideological bias. Should we be surprised that those in favor of open borders score lower on our test of authoritarian attitudes? Probably not. Do the authors provide good reasons to believe their alternate hypothesis? Probably not. But there is admittedly a lot to unpack in that example. The crud factor reminds us that everything tends to be related, at least a little, to everything else. So finding a relation does not mean our explanation is not crud. Most descriptions or explanations of the crud factor invoke signal versus noise. But in psychology, we can say that all differences are signals, and the question is whether we have the right one or the right explanation. I don't really like this interpretation of anything as a signal from a certain point of view, but I must admit that it is a legal, if unhelpful, move in metapsychology conversations. Not everything demands an explanation. For example, just as I was thinking about my mother, she called me but everything does have an explanation. You and your mother love each other, so you think about and call each other enough that these might occasionally overlap, so there is a signal there. So we should not get credit for rejecting a silly null. Let's now assume we have a decent null and a finding of surprise in null land. Our question is then, does the negation of the null directly imply our hypothesis? The answer might be no when a, the null and alternate are not logical negations. So a good example would be uh, if he likes me, he would have called. He did not call, so he doesn't like me. A bad example would be if he likes me, he would have called. He did not call, he does not like phones. Now there's nothing wrong with our conclusions in either case. It is the setup of our test that is violated in the bad example. In the good example, negating liking us means not liking us. In the bad example, the conclusion comes from nowhere. Negating liking us does not imply not liking phones, so either we changed our null to if he likes phones he will call, or we have an illogical relation between the null and alternate. Not liking phones is the opposite of liking us. The thinking tool here would be to ask, wait, what was the initial null hypothesis? and see whether the conclusion is consistent with a negation of it, or see whether the researchers are deceiving themselves or pretending after the fact to have been testing something that they would not reasonably have actually been testing. Returning to our question, we have a decent null, a finding of surprise in null land. Our question is, does the negation of the null directly imply our hypothesis? We just saw that the answer might be no when the null and the alternate are not logical negations. The answer might also be no when we have done everything else right, but b, we have a confound in our design or an extraneous variable influencing things. The classic or common example here is if we are comparing treatment and placebo, and we put people more in need of treatment, the worse off cases in the treatment group. If the treatment group improves more, it could be due to the treatment, but it also could be due to the worse off cases having more room for improvement than the less worse off cases. If the treatment group does not improve more than the placebo group, it could be because the worse off participants were too far gone to receive benefit. Bottom line, negating the null of no difference does not tell us that our reason for the difference, the treatment, is the actual reason. Not because of the crud factor in this case, but because of our design. In fact, not finding a difference does not inform our hypothesis either. 
We could, of course, measure level of severity and with a large sample and sufficient number of cases in each value, still test things with an ANCOVA. In that case, the level of severity would be an independent variable, not a confound. Though it may introduce extraneous variables, such as subjective bias, maybe by age or gender, in who gets rated more severe and is therefore more worthy of treatment, which we tend to optimistically assume will be more helpful than placebo, even though the test is there to find that out, so maybe the treatment or its side effects will be worse for participants. A temptation when going through these nitpicky interpretational issues is to just gloss over them and say, we can't be absolutely sure, we'll just write maybe or p less than 0.01 and this will cover our uncertainty. We can't be wrong if we say somewhere that there's a chance we're wrong, then if we're wrong we're just right that there was a chance we were wrong. Or what is increasingly common, we gloss over these issues with Ours is the morally most appropriate or societally most necessary conclusion. Regardless of whether the work is technically good, it is in the correct framework and therefore advances knowledge and understanding. Now this might be true, but it does not actually deal with the flaws. If your framework or ideological momentum is just, then all the more reason to get things right. So we are in the conceptual space of significance testing. If P meets cutoff, then I can interpret the data as though we are in the world where there is a difference, effect, or relation, or where the data has not come from just one monolithic group. Let's get a feel for this at the individual level. Does a datum or data point belong to a given group or population? If it is exceedingly exceptional for that group, then maybe not. The parameters of the normal curve allow us to use number of standard deviations as a measure of how different from a typical case an observed score is. This number, number of standard deviations from the mean, is the z-score. If Jennifer's reading ability is three standard deviations above average for grade five, and just one standard deviation above average for grade six, we would reasonably conclude that Jennifer does not belong in the grade five reading group. Her reading level, despite her being in grade five, is grade six. Note that this conclusion only works because of the parameters of the normal distribution. If cases did not tend to cluster around the middle, that is, if far from the mean cases were not rarer than close to the mean cases, then in terms of probability, she would be as representative of the grade five group, or the grade five group would be as representative of her as the mean or middle case. She is exceptional because cases tend to cluster at the middle. She's exceptional because the distribution is not flat. And because she is exceptional for this group, we tend to conclude that she does not belong to it, but rather some other group, like grade sixes, or maybe her own group of one. Where Jennifer's school has a non-flat distribution of grade five readers, her far from the mean score is exceptional in that school. Where the population has a non-flat distribution of grade five readers, her far from the mean score is exceptional in that population. Note that this does not make exceptionality morally good, bad, or important. It just allows us to say that her reading is not well described by saying she is a fifth grade reader. Her score being surprising suggests we need a different description, not just the group, to satisfactorily describe the data. You might rightly point out that being high even in a flat distribution is cause for exceptionality. Yes, but not in terms of frequency. Her score is as likely as any other to be obtained sampling randomly from a flat distribution. So in this sense, she would be characteristic of her group. Or more technically, there does not appear to be a group characteristic of fifth grade readers to which she could be said to not belong. The more predictable the group gets, the more meaningful surprises become. Note that this is meant to describe and not explain away the challenges of the normal curve. Most of the things we care about and or invent in psychology are distributed normally in the population. Traits, behaviors, ratings. So the ability to use tools that assume the parameters of the normal distribution are met is very valuable. We know how sampling from normally distributed populations would work and we have enshrined that knowledge in reference tables of probabilities. So as long as what we are studying is normally distributed and our samples are random, we can use those reference tables to see how probable it is to obtain our data under the null hypothesis and make decisions based on that probability. We'll get back to the Z table shortly. For now, let's return to the case of Jennifer from fifth grade. The idea is to test exceptionality or surprise. How is Jennifer's reading not like the expectable fifth grade cases? 
the probability of getting her score, given she was a normal fifth grader, is low. So we conclude that she's not a normal fifth grader. Note that we never assess directly the likelihood that she's not at the fifth grade level, though this can be done if we've done a power analysis. We've just assessed the likelihood that she is at the fifth grade level, which is low. So we conclude that she's not. The specific alternate hypothesis that is appropriate, which could inform our response, is not actually tested. Examples of alternate hypotheses, she is a sixth grade level reader, she's a seventh grade level reader, she's not a human child but an alien, she cheated on the reading tests, or she's a Jennifer from the eighth grade class so we got confused for a fifth grade Jennifer. Our p-value only tells us her score is unlikely, exceptional, or surprising for fifth graders. The strength or likelihood of our alternate hypothesis is not tested. Okay, let's take a very simple question that we should be able to answer. What is the justification for assuming that a given sample is in any way representative of the population of interest? Is this just an assumption? How do we justify estimating parameters from samples? Let's forget for now the previous lectures whinging about how we never have true random samples and assume that we are at least obtaining close to random or at least representative samples or that we are following the advice of only extending our conclusions to the populations that the samples might actually represent. With that assumption installed, the answer for how we can say that any given sample is useful for making inferences outside of itself is the sampling distribution. This is the theoretical construct, though it can of course be computed, of the infinitely or multiply sampled population. If we take a sample from the population, it gives an estimate, mean, and spread. If we take multiple samples and place the means of them into a single distribution, this distribution is a sampling distribution of means. So each data point in this distribution is a mean from a sample, in this case of size 10. If we imagine this sampling distribution is estimating the population mean, because it is, then as sample size gets larger, larger samples contributing their means to the sampling distribution of means, the spread of these means is reduced. N note that their estimates of the population mean value don't get better. The, the middle stays the same with increasing sample size. This is because the sampling distribution samples to infinity, so it finds the mean regardless of whether the sample's contributing means are of two or two hundred people each. But the variability around that mean value shrinks as the sample size grows. The standard error of the sampling distribution shrinks with larger samples contributing to the data points. This tells us that the estimates from larger samples tend to be closer to the population mean. Note that this does not mean that we need a larger sample of samples, i.e. more samples. Rather, just that we need a large sample, period, to get a better population mean estimate and a better population standard deviation estimate. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution is equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. The sampling distribution is not here to tell us to get more samples. It's here to tell us how samples of a given size behave if you had run them multiple times. Knowing the parameters of the distribution allow us to know how well a sample of it of a given size would do at estimating those population parameters. So if we know the thing we are estimating is normally distributed, we know how accurate we should expect a given random sample of it to be, how close to the real mean and the real standard deviation our estimate from a sample of a given size would likely be. This is amazing, remarkable, wonderful, because without this in information, we're reasoning in circles. We would be begging the question of generalization or representativeness. Samples 
or relate to the population because that's what samples do. This is circular. Rather, with the knowledge of how samples of a given size from normally distributed things behave, we can say, I think this sample relates to the population because the population is normally distributed. And if we took more samples that are similar in size to this one from the population, we would expect them to vary this much around the true population value. So that amount of variation is how much I can expect to be off by. The sampling distribution makes this miracle, this specific and non-circular inference, possible. A familiar application of this is the confidence intervals that we see in polling results. Canadian polling companies will generally call a sample of 1,000 or more a statistically significant sample, which is a bit confusing and annoying, but uh, this means that the sample is big enough to use the Z distribution for inference. The primary motivation for getting a sample so large is to assure that the sample's standard deviation is a good estimate of the population standard deviation. We don't need that many in our sample to estimate the mean well. The thousand people is to get around to the fact that smaller samples can potentially drastically underestimate population variance. In other words, pollsters use their sampling distribution knowledge of how much the sample they have would differ from another similar sized sample or set of infinite similar samples to say how accurate the sample they have is uh, likely to be. Our x-bar here is the mean of our sample. Z is our selected level of certainty. S is our standard deviation. With our pollster's large statistically significant sample, we can use the sample standard deviation as the population standard deviation. And N is just the number of individuals, randomly selected individuals, in our sample. To continue our arbitrary example of male Canadian heights, say we sampled 133 males and obtained a mean of 178 centimeters and standard deviation of 19 centimeters. How would we go about putting a confidence interval on this estimate? In other words, how wrong are we likely to be and or how likely are we to be wrong? First, we have to choose how liberal or prone to error or conservative, which is avoidant of error, we prefer to be. We would not be wrong if we set our confidence interval to be infinitely wide, infinitely conservative, but that would not be particularly helpful. Well, the value could be any value. Yeah, you're not wrong, but you're not helpful. Likewise, we won't look very good if we report an extremely narrow range, but we admit that we're just as likely to be right as to be wrong more specifically, that the true mean value is as likely to fall in our estimated interval as it is to fall outside of it. So we have our sample of Canadian male heights, and we want to choose our level of certainty. So let's get to that. We get to choose how conservative or wide our interval is. The industry standard is a 5% probability of a miss, or a 5% of the time for a sample like this, the confidence interval will not contain the true population value. We can select the z-score that corresponds to this probability from our table of usual suspects, or we could compute our own custom confidence interval using a z-table. Say we wanted a 2% probability of a miss. That's not in this usual suspects list on the left here. How do we get the corresponding z-score to plug into our confidence interval equation? The table on the right gives us all we need. First, if we wanted to confirm the value for the 10% probability of miss, we could recall that we need to put 5% of this 10% in one tail and 5% in the other. So the Z value that we want will correspond with where 95% of the Z distribution falls to its left. That value is here. And we see that the values for the ones and tenths places of the z-score is in this left column, and the value for the hundredths place, framed in orange, are found in the top row. So we get 1.6 from the left column and 0.05 from the top row. Doing this again for the 5% probability of miss, the standard 19 times out of 20 reported for most surveys and polls, we take our 5% or 0.05 and we put half in each tail. So we're looking for the score where 97.5% or 0.975 of the distribution falls to its left. Here it is. We get 
from the left column and 0.06 from the top row for a score of 1.96. Now, what we wanted was a custom confidence interval of 2% probability of a miss. I suggest you pause and try to find it yourself. We put 1% in each tail, so we want the score where 99% of the distribution falls to its left. So our Z in that example would be... Two point three three, but I already used a ninety-five percent confidence interval in my example, so let's go with that one and complete our example calculation. We have all of our values plugged in. Nineteen times out of twenty, this confidence interval, or more strictly ones like it, will contain the actual population value according to our sampling distribution knowledge. This is provided our sample was random, but you know assumptions. So we can report our results. This is an inference, it's not just a description. The mean height of adult Canadian males is 1.78 centimeters, plus or minus uh, 3.23 centimeters, 19 times out of 20. We, it's, it's an inference and not just a description because we do not know the mean height of Canadian males. We're inferring it with some expected level of error from our sample. We see reported two things, the margin of error, plus or minus, and the level of certainty x times out of y. The level of certainty is just a pre-selected z value chosen based on how sure one wants to be that the estimated interval contains the true value, and the margin of error is just that z value times the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, also called the standard error. That, we recall, is the population standard deviation, or our estimate of it, divided by the square root of the sample side. The standard error is how much means of that sample size will vary, how much they tend to miss the population value. This is parameter estimation in action. It is easy to forget that our samples, if we want to make inferences, are estimating unknown values and unknown differences between those values. That is, our sample values and computations are estimates when or more of them could be off, leading to erroneous conclusions. This is the fact that makes statistics necessary and the fact that makes statistics useful. Statistical methods make sure we assess and reduce our chance of making an error in inference. With this in mind, next we touch on the assumptions and the application of this for this week, which is t-tests. Assumptions. Our t-tests assume that firstly, the data we have is normal. It describes or follows or fits a normal distribution. T-test logic is based on the hypothetical sampling distribution being normally distributed, so we can know how off our estimate is likely to be. As we saw in the sampling distribution simulations a few minutes ago, non-normal populations still result in normal-shaped sampling distributions. The caveat here is that the sample size, the size of the samples of which the sampling distribution consists, has to be large, 30 plus, to get a normal-shaped sampling distribution, like the one that informs the z-table from non-normal populations. In other words, the normality of the population need not actually concern us. Of course, it will concern us in the real world later on because it makes a big difference whether we are applying models in a normal-shaped population where guessing the middle value results in far less overall error compared to the flat or uniformly distributed population. But what the test needs, because the test wants to make sure it can reasonably know how other samples like our sample would tend to behave, what the test needs for this is for the sampling distribution to be normal. For a nice symmetrical distribution from which to obtain a standard error estimate. And as we've seen, the characteristics of the sampling distribution are determined by our sample. Firstly, its size, its n, and also its standard deviation, modified by the sample size, as an estimate of the standard error. So, with t-tests, population normality is preferred but not necessary. Sampling distribution normality is required but not known, and so sample distribution normality is required to infer or assume the required normality of the sampling distribution. t-tests and parametric tests more generally also assume that the variation or spread of scores in our sample 
or samples is similar to the variation in the population. When we have multiple groups, the homogeneity refers to sameness between the groups and their population and between the two groups themselves. If we've been paying attention, we know that the sample spread is used to estimate the population spread to inform the sampling spread, or standard error. The tests assume that the scale of our data is consistent. Interval or ratio level data is assumed. In SPSS, the word used is scale data, so you have a scale scale. Elsewhere, the word continuous tends to suffice. Finally, random sampling is supposed to take care of independence, or at least one type of independence. If all the people you poll read the same newspaper, then they are tied together in a way that will systematically bias the results of that poll if you intend to generalize it outside of that newspaper's readership. It also could be an experimental design problem. If the individuals in the experimental groups in your market research test are allowed to interact, an individual with a strong opinion could influence those around her and unduly bias that experimental group. If five people are led to adopt her opinion or her intensity of opinion, who otherwise would not have independently had that, then it is as though her opinion is counted six times rather than once biasing the data and subsequent group comparisons that you make. So in many cases, we need two types of independence. First, randomly sampled people who are second kept from influencing each other. Of course, we cannot keep someone from influencing herself. So if we're testing for a difference between paired samples or doing repeated measures research, seeking that type of independence would just be silly. In fact, the t-test in that situation is called a dependent t test. Also in paired or repeated measures designs, i.e. where we use dependent t-tests, we don't have to worry about homogeneity of variance. Although we don't have to worry generally about homogeneity of variance in independent t-tests either. So long as one group size is not so comparatively large as to be dominating a very different variance estimate of the smaller group. We have been using the Z sampling distribution or standard normal curve and its tables to see how likely we are to get our score in the world where the score belongs to the group or distribution. The z-score just tells us how many standard deviations the observed score is from the mean, but we can reference a z-table using this score to obtain our desired probability and to make our decision as to whether the score belongs with or is well represented or described by that distribution. This assumes that we either know the population standard deviation or have a sample size big enough that our sample approximates it. Usually in the real world, we do not have the population standard deviation and often our samples are not that large. Recall that the problem with smaller samples is that the spread of the sampling distribution, the standard error, is not well estimated by them. If there are few very extreme cases, small samples are unlikely to find them. Or if they do find them, they will not have enough less extreme cases to balance out those extreme cases they found. So when small samples miss the extreme values, they drastically underestimate population spread, and when they do find them, they drastically overestimate population spread. So a sampling distribution that contained values of sample standard deviations, this would be a sampling distribution of sample standard deviations, rather than of sample means, would be quite wide for small sample sizes and dramatically narrower for larger sample sizes. This means we need a model of the sampling distribution that captures or adjusts for the impact that sample size has on the reliability of standard error estimation. This is what William Gossett noticed when he was playing with Ronald Fisher's statistical distributions. The legend goes that he was applying significance tests in his work as an experimental brewer with Guinness, and rules about trade secrets prevented him from publishing under his real name, so he used the humble pseudonym Student to publish his small sample corrections, the T distributions. But a thorough research by thirsty historians could find zero evidence that he actually used the stats in his work. It looks like he came up with a T family of distributions mostly for fun. Why? To have reference tables and distributions that represent the behavior of smaller samples, which underestimate standard error in inverse proportion to how small they are. The smaller your sample, the less likely it is to be close to the mean, but more importantly, the smaller your sample, the more that samples like it will vary in their standard deviations. And we use the sample standard deviation to estimate the population standard deviation in our calculation of the sampling distribution's standard error. Z tables don't care about your sample size. 
t-tables give you different answers based on the size of your sample. The smaller your sample, the more t will conservatively widen the expectable range of sample results. So we can memorize what z-scores mean. 1.96 is the two-tailed 95% cutoff. But what any given t-score means will depend on how large the sample that made it was. How many observations are behind it? With a smaller sample size, fewer degrees of freedom, we need a bigger t-score to get the same level of surprise, rarity, or exceptionality. This means wider confidence intervals and higher critical cutoff values as sample sizes shrink. Z is a single standard normal distribution providing standard probability interpretations for given z-score values. T is a family of distributions providing different probability interpretations for given t-scores based on sample size. The three flavors of T are one sample, independent, and dependent or paired T. One sample tests compare a sample to its hypothesized or known population. If I think the crickets in my backyard are bigger than the Canadian average, I might look up the average size, grab some from the backyard, measure them, and then see whether my results, my data, would be expectable if the ones I measured were sampled from around Canada. If my sample would be surprising in that reality, I conclude I am in the reality where my crickets are special. Independent two-sample t-tests compare two unique samples to each other. If I specifically think that the crickets in my backyard are larger than the crickets in my mother's backyard, I might take a sample from each yard, compute the means, and pool the variance and see whether obtaining the mean difference, obtaining my data, would be likely in the world where both samples were actually taken from the same place or population. If it appears unlikely that one population would yield two means so different, then I choose the explanation that leads me to be less surprised. I conclude that I am in the reality where the two crickets come from different populations. There is a difference between the samples. Finally, dependent two sample t-tests look for change within the same group across time. If I think that something in the miracle grow that I'm feeding my grass will make the bugs outside grow too, I might take a measurement of the crickets, applying tiny cataloging tags to them so I know who is whom when I measure them again later before I apply the miracle grow, and then follow up with another measurement once the miracle grow has had a chance to take effect. If the distribution of difference scores is unlikely to be centered on mean zero, in other words, if the observed data are unlikely in the world where the crickets did not grow, then I conclude I am in the reality where the crickets did grow. And I, of course, attribute this growth to my alternate hypothesis that the miracle grow grew the crickets. In each case, the null reality or null hypothesis is the one being assessed, and the p-value is telling us the probability of obtaining the data in that null reality. See the R video for how to get these results. We'll see you next time.